Welcome to Lab 16. Today we're going to be talking about simulations, and today's lab is a bit more of an open lab than the ones we've had previously. What I mean by that is that we've got two different programs that are going to be here. One is an ecosystem simulator, and the other is a chatbot. They're both intended just to be experimented around with and don't have necessarily a, a closely scripted set of activities. So my plan is just to go through examine how each of these these projects work and then spend a little time doing the activities that are proposed however I encourage you to spend as much time as you want to go more in depth with them if you feel so inclined so to start at the top the first section is actually optional it's just to get a feel for a bunch of different places where where computational simulations are used in modern life there's also a brief description about why simulation is so important. It's really given us a lot of opportunities both in science and engineering as well as a number of other fields to do things that we weren't able to do before this sort of technology was around. There's some pretty significant examples in this list and probably plenty more that you could come up with with a simple web search. So feel free to read over any of these that interest you. I'm going to go ahead and skip on down to the first programming activity here, which is the ecosystem simulation. So this is a BYOB project that's intended to simulate multiple types of species coexisting in the same habitat. This first section describes the concept of an equilibrium and how populations, competing populations can, can have different effects on each other's populations. This is exactly what we're going to be simulating. What we're simulating today is going to be a very basic version of this, but nevertheless, the ideas that we're going to be using can apply at scale too. So we've got a simulator project that can be downloaded, which I've got, and then there's three different steps to what, what we're looking at today. The first one of these is described here. And all we need to do for this first step is run the simulator and see what happens. Step number two is to make a couple changes to the pre-existing population models. We'll have a shark model and we'll have a fish model. And then step three is to add an entirely new population model, a new kind of creatures. Today I'm going to make a crab or something like that. And then we'll run that for a little while to see how the three species interact together. There's a couple tips down here that you may want to read before we get started as well. What we're going to do first, though, is just open up this project. It may look a little overwhelming at first, but we will try our best to get through it. So if you go to the world sprite, this is where everything's going to kick off. Whenever the green flag is clicked, this is the single path that's going to start got some initialization blocks up here that are just doing some heavy, lift, heavy lifting for us. We've got a list that's storing the grid in it, which are what creatures are present in each cell. They all start off as blank, as you can see. That'll later be changed to things like fish and shark. Initialize simulator. It's doing a little bit more. It's setting the initial value of variables, clearing a bunch of lists that are important for our, our future computation, and then just configuring a little bit more, setting initial positions of uh, individual creatures and so on. So we get through that, then we've got a prepare species broadcast that launches right before we get into our main loop. This forever block is what's going to run for the majority of our program, and each trip through this loop is going to count as one time step for the simulation. You can think of this as a day, a year, whatever you want to do, whatever time step is appropriate for whatever you're trying to simulate. So if we go over to sharks, shark and fish are each going to respond differently to each of these broadcasts. Before we do that though, let's just run this uh, simulation and see what happens. So we can get a feel for what we should even be looking for. First thing that's going to happen after everything is initialized is this prepare species. 
that shouldn't do anything visible, but that's going to be doing more data manipulation for each of the species. You can think of it as a setup step as well. Then we get into the forever loop, and that's where stuff starts getting interesting. We start off clearing the screen, then we'll do a broadcast. This broadcast is going to draw all of the tiles for the simulation, which we'll be seeing in just a second, to show us where all the spe species are in the environment. Then we're going to start manipulating data. Okay, so there we've got the draw stage. Observe surroundings is going to react, it's going to allow the species, species to react to a set of rules. These can be rules based on uh, reproduction or rules based on uh, predator and prey relationships and that sort of thing. The fluctu fluctuate stage then copies all of the data that changed in the observed surrounding stage into the main grid. So all the modifications are made in a new grid for observed surroundings and then fluctuate copies all that data over to the uh, the actual grid list here. Okay, so as we can see here, something terrible happened to the sharks. It seems they starved out. And fish are probably going to start doing pretty well because of that. So we could let this run for a while, but uh, for now, I'm just going to stop it. And let's take a look at what each of these blocks does, each, each of these broadcasts does for a particular species. Turns out that the fish and shark do similar things, so I'm just going to look at sharks now, and we'll look at differences as they become relevant. Okay, so draw executes this draw all of species block. This is what's doing the stamping. And we've got two loops here, one moving through the rows of the grid, another moving through the columns of the grid, and it essentially just moves one cell at a time, and any time we find a cell that's got shark as the word in the grid, that's an indicator that we need to stamp an image of a shark. And then we move to the next cell, and so on and so on. So each of the different species, as well as the world, is going to do this whenever draw is broadcast in order to stamp out this grid that we see here. Observe surroundings is actually let's do prepare species first. That's what happens first chronologically. So we've got a, a couple variables being set here. These variables are specific to this particular sprite. So they are uh, local variables. The chance of reproduction is 30 percent for a shark. If we flip over to fish, the chance of reproduction is 85 percent. So fish are much more likely to reproduce each time step than a shark is. Oh, but it's not all good news for the fish, as you might expect. We'll hear about that later. If we look in prepare species data, we're doing a bit more list manipulation. This isn't particularly important to understanding how the simulation works, so I'm just going to skip over it. Um, feel free to take a look at the content of these different lists if you'd like to try and reverse engineer what's going on. Uh, I encourage you to do so. But it's not it's not necessarily important for for getting through the lab. And it's a bit out of scope even for the class. Okay, so uh, finally and most importantly we've got this add block. This is adding a new rule which is a script. This is going to be executed each time we go through we make a particular time step or excuse me, each time we make any time step, this is the rule that's going to be executed for sharks. There are two different parts to this rule. The first is if the number of neighbors of shark is less than one, meaning it has no neighbors that are also sharks, or if there are more than three neighbors. A neighbor here is identified as any of the eight squares around the particular shark. So if either the shark is alone, or if the shark, or if there is too much competition for food in the area, then the shark is going to die. So we'll remove that shark from the current cell. Otherwise, if neither one of those is true, then we're just going to 
randomly determine whether the shark gets to reproduce. And this is just a little a function here to um, give us this base chance of 30%, and then the more fish that are surrounding this particular shark, uh, the higher chance, the greater the chance of reproduction. So it starts off at 30, and then we get an additional 5% for each fish in the in the area. So if a shark is existing with relatively few sharks around, but happen to, happens to have a lot of fish around, this is going to be a very prosperous and fertile shark. So its chances of reproduction go up. And in that case, we are going to create a shark in some cell that's randomly selected, selected from all of the surrounding cells. You can also look inside of these gray blocks if you want. There's not a whole lot to those. Uh, but may help you understand some other pieces if you're interested. So hopefully this makes sense. Again, we've got a, a death rule up top, which is either from loneliness and inability to reproduce, or overcrowding. The second rule is a reproduction rule, which is based on, in the shark's case, uh, a relatively low percentage increased by the number of fish in the immediate area. If we look over at fish, we've got similar rules, but the numbers are going to be a bit different. So the death rule here, it's actually got two death rules for fish. If there are more than two sharks around, this fish is going to die, for obvious reasons. And then there's an overcrowding rule for fish as well. Fish are a little more tolerant than sharks are, so they can survive if there are uh, or they only die if there are zero other fish around or if there are more than six fish around. Finally, the reproduction rule doesn't have any modifiers on this. It's 85% flat regardless of the situation that's around, unless of course that fish dies and then it doesn't get a chance to reproduce. And again, these rules are not being executed right now. They are higher order functions that are being added to a rules list. This list will contain the functions and those will be executed in the actual uh, the simulation loop. Remember this is the prepare species broadcast, so if we return back to world where this is called, we'll see that it's called before the, called before the loop starts. So this is stuff that only has to happen once. You could think of it as like a, a setup for each of the species. Once the setup is complete, we jump into the forever loop, clear off any damage that might have been done to the screen already and start drawing. Drawing we've already seen. Observe surroundings we can take a peek at real quick. So all that happens here is a prepare next move and apply changes using rules. I believe that's the same for fish. Yes it is. So let's just take a look in sharks again. This block starts off by copying the current grid into this grid of what's going to be happening in the future. This is the grid that Fluctuate is later going to copy over as well. We want to make our modifications to this next move grid so that all the, uh, all the modifications don't end up impacting more than we intend for them to. And what I mean for that is, if we've got a grid, oops, wow. Sorry about that. If we've got just a very simple grid here and have a fish right here and a shark right here and a shark right here, if the fish runs through all its tests and determines that it should reproduce. there, let's say, this shark here in the middle should only really do, re execute its action based on the existence of the fish above it, not the fish to its left. This is valid. Because the fish to its left didn't actually exist when that time spot, when that uh, time step was taken. So in order to keep our model as accurate as possible, we're using the second grid that doesn't make modifications 
to the current data, but pr but populates in a, in a data structure that we're later going to copy over into Grid again and overwrite what's already there. Okay, so this is copying the data over. So next move will now look identical to Grid, and then we're resetting neighbors. That's that's a detail uh, I, I won't really go into now. So that is the prepare next move stage and then apply changes using rules. This is a bit of a doozy. There's a lot going on. The ultimate purpose of all of this though is this bottom for loop that we've got here. This for loop we take each of the rules that we added to this list previously and we run that function with two inputs. These two inputs are what the rest of this code is doing. We're computing what the current cell is or really just pulling the current cell out of this list of cells. So this will be the number uh, like one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, depending on what cell it is. And then immediates will be a list containing all of the um, creatures that exist around whatever, immediately around whatever the current creature is in the in current cell. So if current cell were this fish here in the middle, then the immediates would be fish, fish, blank, fish, blank, fish, blank, blank. Okay, so all of this heavy lifting up here occurs just so that we can run right here. And that is where the core of the simulation goes on. That one line right down here, this run block. Looks really simple, but it and it's reusing these scripts we just looked at a second ago in order to make interesting and somewhat directed ran directed random actions occur. Okay, so once observe surroundings completes, we move on to fluctuate, which we've touched on a little bit already. And if we look down at fluctuate, there's going to be very similar for both species. This is simply going to go through and update the grid uh, excuse me, update the list called grid uh, to account for any changes that occurred in the simulation. So this first check is looking for any deaths that may have occurred among this current species and then the one right after that is looking for any additions that may have occurred. If it finds either, it copies it over into the into grid and then changes the fluctuate counter by one. This is happening in both species, as you can see, identical code, and is really just an update function for uh, for tweaking our grid here. Okay, and that is the whole simulation. Now let's try tweaking something. So we've seen a couple parameters that could be tweaked on a per species basis. The sharks didn't do so well this time. So why don't we give them a little bit of help? Let's say they have a 60% chance of reproducing. Now some interesting things may happen here if we think about this. Uh, first of all, it's unlikely that they are just going to die out right at the start because their chances of uh, reproduction are, are just going to be higher. However, their chances of overcrowded overcrowding are also going to get higher since it's easier for them to produce larger numbers of their own species. So it may actually lead to some additional deaths, but chances are it's going to be good for their species in the long run. So I'm going to go ahead and run this and l let it run for a while. Uh, I'll, I'll fast forward the video in the meantime and we'll talk about it after a couple of steps have passed.
Okay, so that's 10 steps, and as you can see, the crabs have done reasonably well. All the species, in fact, have survived, at least through 10 time steps. And uh, we could continue to let the simulation run if we wanted to, however, I'm just going to go ahead and stop it at this point. Great. So that's one example of a relatively straightforward species we could make. As you can probably imagine, much more complex rules for reproduction and death could also be implemented if you so desired. Okay, so let's head back to the activity. If we drop back again, there is one more uh, project here to look at, which is Gregory the Chatbot. Gregory is based on an old research project named Eliza, which was a machine that was designed to try to pass as a human in conversation. So if we go back, there's a little bit of history, but the code itself is here in the next part. You, you can download the project, and we can look at a simplified version of Eliza. So here we are. Project starts over here on the stage. Looks like a lot of stuff, but the actual parts that are being executed uh, of significance are actually quite short. So we start up here in the top left corner. When the green flag is clicked, there's going to be three stages that are undergone. The first one loads a bunch of lists with responses. The second one loads a bunch of keywords that we can use to detect what sort of response we should use. And then the third one starts the actual therapy session here. So now if we go over to the Eliza sprite. Here's start session. This is going to be the first thing that starts in the Eliza sprite. First of all, we'll clear the history, which is where we're going to keep track of all the things that the user says to the therapist. And then we're going to set this variable called Gregory reply. This is something that we'll be using throughout the sprite as we get into the main loop and start doing some, some uh, computation. So continue session is our main loop. We want to repeat until we get some kind of response that is registered as a response that Eliza says when it's time to say goodbye. So when that occurs, we just say that final response and consider the program complete. Until then, though, we want to ask whatever the reply is. So first of all, what would you like to talk about? Whatever the answer is, we convert that to a list and then store that in the history. Then we want to do some pronoun switching, which I'll talk about in just a second. So just to make, just to be clear, if the user says something like, I feel sick, we'll convert this into a list where we split on spaces. So the first item will be I, second one will be feel, third one will be sick. Okay. Then pronoun switch is going to create a new string that's going to swap words like I and turn it into you. The idea being that this is what Eliza could say back to us. Tell me more about why you feel sick, for example. Okay. Then once that's done, we want to consider the answer, which is replace whatever the value is of Gregory reply with something that makes sense given the answer that they provided. So consider answers right below. And all we're doing here, this is a fairly naive technique, is looking through all the words that were in the, the user's uh, response to the question. And if any of them fall into, into a particular category, we can retrieve a random response from that, uh, the responses that are registered for that category. So for example, let's take a look at one of these lists. We've got greeting keywords and greeting responses. 
So here's some responses and the keywords that trigger it. So if, if the user says anything where one word is hello, sup, or what's up, Eliza's going to pick one of these random responses and replay that back to the user. Same is true for some profanity words. Same is true for some depression words. Same is true for the goodbye words. And the goodbye words, remember, uh, excuse me, the goodbye responses are what triggers the end of the program. It's, so as soon as the user enters a phrase that has bye, goodbye, farewell, or peace in it, that's when the session's going to terminate. There are also a couple, couple phrases over here in the stage that are computed each time. These are computed each time because there's a, a value in here that changes. One notable example here is the family list. So if the user mentions, so, mentions something about a particular family member, that can be translated here into the response. So tell me more about your brother. Are you close to your brother? Those sorts of responses can be generated through this refresh responses broadcast. And this is executed each time the user provides a response as opposed to these two other columns here which are only executed once at the very beginning because they don't change. And that's the essence of how this project works. Again, relatively naive algorithm, uh, but it's still kind of fun to play with. If we go back and review the last exercise, you'll see that one comment that is here uh, is that Gregory does not handle punctuation correctly. So if we go back to the example that I wrote out a moment ago, I have a period on the end. So if sick was a keyword, then this, then the program wouldn't naturally rec recognize sick period as being equivalent to sick. In fact, it would say that they are not equal. What we need to do is then strip this period away. Punctuation in general isn't going to be particularly useful for us. So let's modify this program real quick, just to ignore punctuation. And the second activity I'm just going to leave up to you. There's a lot of different ways you can make Eliza seem a little bit more realistic, whether that's being able to handle um, new types of keywords, maybe looking at particular phrases instead of individual words, all that kind of stuff um, could be used to extend Eliza and make her seem a little bit more realistic. But for now, let's stick with punctuation. Okay. So there are a number of places you could eliminate the punctuation. One of the most uh, intuitive and also one of the more efficient places you could do it is in this string to list block. The reason it's more efficient than other places is that if you look inside of this block, we're actually iterating through all of the letters in the user's response anyway. So we're looping through letter by letter and looking for spaces. That's how we break the string of text into a list where each element is a word. So if while we're moving through this, instead of just looking for spaces, we also look for punctuation, then we should be set. If we didn't do it in this function, it would require that we iterate through all the letters uh, in, in the answer, again, just looking for punctuation. This keeps us from having to, to do that, from having to iterate through one time just to eliminate punctuation and allows us to make only a single trip through instead. So in order to modify um, this block to get rid of punctuation, we need to keep everything like it is, 
but also insert another conditional here. So if there's a space, we still want to split uh, everything that come before from everything that comes after. However, we also want to check See if a list contains whatever the current letter is. And the list we're going to be checking is one we'll make. And we can extend this to include whatever punctuation we want. Let's say period, comma, question mark, and exclamation mark. And if any of those happen, all we want to do is change i by 1. Move on to the next letter. To contrast that with any other letter, what we normally do is just join whatever we have so far with the new letter. Here we're just going to skip that letter. We're not going to do any joining and just move along. So note what we're doing here. We're not actually changing the variable answer. Answer is still going to have all the punctuation, but we actually never use answer again uh, with a couple exceptions. Uh, after this point. So we're modifying the form that we are going to use later, which is the list that gets inserted into the history list. And by doing that, we get rid of any occurrence, any situations where um, punctuation is even going to be noticed by the rest of our program. So now if we look at history, I can provide an input. I feel, oops, I feel sick. You'll notice what gets added is you feel sick. The punctuation is gone. We've also done the pronoun switching. And everything seems to work correctly. So that wraps up this lab. Uh, we'll be back next time to discuss two very powerful ideas, Lambda and Hoffs, for the first of a series of two labs. We'll see you then.